Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Stop there is verses 3 through 8 are one sentence in Greek. And uh, it was a good place to stop. It's not really a, a major paragraph division there, but we can't cover a whole lot more than that. It's very important that I uh, go through these introductions slowly and word by word. I, I know I've been through several with you already, but I think as I re-emphasize these words and these concepts, the only way we learn is usually by repetition. And uh, did you catch the uh, repetitious nature of Paul's introduction? Now, Paul was a man of his day. We forget that sometimes. We kind of think that he just wrote different from anybody else that ever wrote. That inspiration means that you just cut yourself loose from any kind of historical uh, rootage or grounding and just do your own thing. As you would start a letter, dear so-and-so, and as you would sign it, however you sign it respectfully, in Jesus' name, uh, whatever you'd sign it, that form is a form that most of us follow when we write letters. Now, we don't even think about it. We just use the form of greeting and the salutation uh, that everybody else does. Paul did the same thing. There was a Greek form of letter writing. Now, the great apostle, the Gentile, just slightly changed that form and made it distinctly Christian. Matter of fact, if you'll notice, I know you didn't have time enough reading through that, but you can almost tell the problem in the church by the introduction that Paul writes. Have you ever thought about that? You can tell something about the church or why he's writing or who he's writing to by the way he writes the first two sentences or the first two verses of every, every epistle. He said they're very similar, but did you notice that they were each one different? Each one different? Now, what was the same about them? There were some things that were the same. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. That's pretty standard, wasn't it? Uh, grace and peace to you from God the Father. Pretty standard, wasn't it? Now, it sounded like that the Lord Jesus Christ was added on most of those, didn't it? From God the Father, great grace and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ was a pretty standard kind of phraseology. But it's different in Colossians. Now, let's look here. Why would Paul, writing to a church that he did not know, right? He had never been to Colossae. He didn't found this church. One of the men from this town, Epaphras, we find that in verse 7, preached there and started this church. Paul had never met him. Why would Paul have to say to a church he never met, Paul, an apostle by the will of God? Why? Were they doubting he was an apostle? That's an interesting problem. Most of the commentaries I read said, no, 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 no. Uh, he just doesn't know these Christians and he wants them to know that he's an apostle. That's kind of like saying um, nobody knows that President Carter is the president unless he signs it President Carter. I mean, all the Christians knew Paul was an apostle. My soul, that guy caused more trouble and rumbling and grumbling and fighting and bickering. <laughs> and churches he went to, you know, they knew who Paul was. He'd been in Ephesus two years, a hundred miles away where Ephesus came from. He didn't have to say he was an apostle for those folks to know who he was. Now, I hope tonight, at some time in the last four years, that you've bought a reference Bible with a concordance and with maps. And I want you to flip in the back of your Bible to your maps. I want you to look at the map on the missionary journeys of Paul, and I want you to find the province of Phygia, which is where it's in modern Turkey, is where the city of Colossae is. And then I want you to find the province of Galatia. Galatia. Now, the introduction to Galatians was very strict. Paul says, I wasn't called by men nor of man. I was called by God. Boy, he really getting strong in the, in the book of uh, Galatians about who he is. Why? Because they were, that's what the Judaizers were who denied his apostleship and were criticizing the deity of Christ. Now, look how close Galatia is. Now, Galatians was written to one church, written to the churches in the province of Galatia. Look how close on the map Galatia and Phygia are. They're right next together, aren't they? Y'all found it? How many of you found it, what I'm talking about? You see where Phrygia is? 
in Colossae and then Galatia. You ought to try to say Phrygia without brushing your teeth. I want to have a rough one. I think there might have been some of these uh, Judaizers in Galatia that just crossed that provincial line and were causing trouble in Colossae and Hierapolis and Laodicea, the Lycus Valley. But even more than personally that I think that Paul wants to counteract any heretical group uh, in the sense of saying, look, I'm an apostle whether you like it or not. I don't think he's really fighting the heretics on his apostleship. I think he's saying, guys, I'm writing you a letter and I want you to know this letter's from God. You see, when Paul says, I'm an apostle, the word apostle means someone sent on official behalf of someone else. Uh, we could almost translate it official ambassador. Paul was the official representative of no one less than the glorified, risen Son of God, Jesus Christ. He wanted to know that. He said, guys, Jesus sent me here to talk to you. Now, boy, that's authority. This ain't somebody's opinion. This ain't something you can take or leave. This isn't something you're going to vote on. Paul, an apostle by the will of God, writes to you. Look up there, folks. God's talking. That's, that's what it's doing. He's right there saying, bang this is not from men. This is from God. I'm his official representative, and I'm here to talk about the problem in your church. That's, that's Paul. Now, he can do that. Nobody else after that can. When the apostles died, that, that maneuver was over. <laughs> okay? So I think it, it's that. Now, notice uh, in Galatians he says, not of men, uh, not by the will of man. They see in Galatia he's got a problem of people doubting his authority. I don't think that problem is in Colossae. They weren't saying Paul's not an apostle. They were saying Jesus, yes, but. Paul's right as far as Paul goes, but we've got to go further than Paul. So they weren't denying who he was. They were just adding to what he said. And so he didn't go into the whole rigmarole here, row here about by the will of God. Now, from your knowledge of the book of Acts, when Paul says an apostle by the will of God, what is he talking about? What does Paul talk about over and over in his sermons in the book of Acts? His personal testimony of getting knocked to the ground on the way to Damascus persecuting the church and Jesus speaking to him. Now he relates that three times in three sermons. That was his personal testimony. He recorded it often. He said, I'm who I am, not because I wanted to be, not because I'm so good, not because I'm so intelligent. I am what I am by the will of God. Okay of Jesus Christ. Now, we need to analyze that because you read that and just right over the top of your head, you've read it so many times, it has no meaning to you. It's like saying Ralph Smith, right? Ralph, I'm an apostle of Ralph Smith and our brother. Now, those two words are extremely important. The word Christ is not the first name of Jesus. It is his title. It is who he is. Christ is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Messiah, or the Anointed One. When they call him Christ, they are saying, in essence, you are the promised one from the Old Testament, fulfilling all the promises to man that were made to Moses and through the prophets. That word Christ is extremely significant. It means Messiah. Have you heard of some of the Second Baptist radio commercials? Have you? There have been a lot of them lately. Uh, when they say, we trying to serve uh, the Christ, you see, they're, they're picking up on this idea of the word Christ being not just the name, but the official title of who Jesus is, the Messiah. Now, the word Jesus is very important. Hebrews really took pains in naming their children. And if they had a life-changing experience, many times they changed their lives. Sarai, Sarah, Abram, Abraham, Jacob, Israel, and on and on. Jesus means something. Now, the word Jesus is exactly the same word as Joshua. Joshua. Now, it's the same word as Hosea, but Joshua adds Yahweh to the front of Hosea and makes it Yahshua. Yahweh saves instead of just he saves. Hosea, he saves. Joshua. Yahweh saves. Jesus saves is what that means. Yahweh saves what Jesus means. 
We find that definition in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, where the angel said to Mary, you shall name him Jesus. She couldn't call him Dick Ralph, Sally, Sue, you know. There's a name for that boy. And uh, it was Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Now, those titles that we just go over, just have meanings. And we need to lock down those meanings to realize the fullness of the revelation. Paul, by the will of God, an apostle, and our brother Timothy. Now, Timothy, I think, if not the co-author, is the co-sender. Now, we're going to find that in verse uh, 3 here. It says, every time we pray for you. I can't believe the number of commentators that say this is the editorial we. Well, he didn't mention Timothy for nothing. It, it, all the way through here, it switches from plural to singular. I think Timothy was there. Now, whether he added anything or not, I don't know. But Paul and Timothy are writing. Okay? Timothy, now what does your Bible say in verse 2? To, mine has to the, the consecrated and faithful brothers. Does yours have to the saints and believers or something like that? Saints and what? Faithful brethren. Okay, let's look at those two words. What is a saint? Good Christian? Dead Christian? <laughs> What's a saint? Saint somebody who's seen the Lord with their physical eyes? What is a saint? Well, let's, let's see where the word comes from. We've got to see where it comes from so we can understand what it is. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, God's people are called a holy nation. A holy nation. Now, the word holy in the Old Testament means set apart for God's service. Dedicated, committed for a special purpose. And when it's a relationship with God, it's for God's purposes. A specially set apart nation, that was Israel. Now, the word uh, holy and the word saint and the word sanctified are all the same root. They're all the same word. To be a saint is to be holy. To be holy is to be sanctified or consecrated. Okay? All the same word. So, God's people, the New Testament church, are the equivalent of the Old Testament people of God who are called apart not to live their own lives because they've been bought with a price. They are called apart by God to serve him as a holy people representative to a lost world. Now, see how the word saint just illumines with light when you do a little background study in it? Okay, let's look at the word faithful. Now, some of you have what, any other translation besides faithful? Yes, remember what's yours? The holy and faithful? Okay, anybody else? Let's look at the word faithful for a minute. The word faithful is the very same word as the word believing. Faith and belief are the same Greek word. Did you know that? When the, John 3.16 says, Whosoever believes in him, we could just as well translate it, Whosoever faith him. So a faithful brother is a believing brother. Now, I think it should better be translated to the saints and believing brethren. I think it's emphasizing the believing aspect. Now, why would I want to make it believers more than faithful? What's the background epistle? Heretics in the church. Heretics denied Jesus Christ. Now, faithful does, uh, does fit in there, but believers, because it's a theological problem, not a loyalty problem as far as coming and being faithful, but a theological heresy. I think to the holy, set apart, and believing brethren at Colossae. Now look at your map again, see where Colossae is. I won't go over all that, it's in the introduction, but it's a significant town. It used to be, it's a little small village now, in a wealthy, wealthy valley. This little name, this, this name of Colossae came to mean a certain color of sheep's wool. That's how uh, uh, well known this area was for its wool producing. Now. Who are in union with Christ. Now, you simply have in Christ, right? In Christ. In Christ is a particular construction that Paul loves. I don't know how many times he uses it. If I just had to guess, I would say 125 plus times in Paul's writing, not including Hebrews. 125 times Paul says, in Christ. Now, he's meaning something by that. He's just not saying that. What is Paul trying to say by over and over and over and over and over and over again? He even does it again in verse 4 again, in his first little eight verses, twice. In Christ, 
What does that mean? It is a construction in Greek known as a locative of fear. It means that Christians move and live in the atmosphere of Jesus. We can't, we're like goldfish and the only environment that we can live in is Christ. As a goldfish dies outside of the water, or if you change the water to salt water, he dies. So Christians can only exist and live and move and have their being in Jesus Christ. It's a positional thing. It is a union thing. It is not so much what you have done as it's what the Holy Spirit has done. When you accepted Christ, he baptized you into Christ, and you are positionally in him. It's not about your feelings, about your commitment, about your work. It's about who Jesus is and how he's rapture in his love. In Christ. Uh, then mine has spiritual blessing. It's the word grace. Now, here we have the very common Greek greeting. Now, the word greeting, we find it in 1 James, uh, 1 James, <laughs> James 1.1. 1, 1. <laughs> James 1.1. 1, 1. James uses the regular Greek greeting, greetings. Now, that's the word chiron. 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 Chorus. Chiron. Chorus. Chorus is the word for grace. Very close. Just two letters different. Paul has just taken the normal greeting and changed it from greeting to grace. Now, that just wasn't just something he wanted to do. Grace is the fundamental source of all that we are as God's people. You are what you are tonight by the grace of God. You exist and move and have your being by the undeserved, unmerited, free love of God for you. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. You ain't worth it. God loves you. By the grace of God, grace and peace. The word peace, I think Paul being a Jew, his mind went back to the Old Testament term for peace, which is, anybody know? Shalom. Shalom. It means the, not only the absence of problems, but the presence of good. Grace and peace, okay? I, I tell you what, I like John. 1427 where Jesus says, and I think it's just one of the most beautiful statements in the world, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, they let them be afraid. There's something about being God's kid that takes the pressure of the world off. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, and mine has a period there. And King James has what else? And the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Is that right? King James, is that right? Okay. Now, either mine's leaving something out or yours adding something. That's, that, there ain't no two ways about it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, you've got two options. Somebody stuck something in, somebody just took something out. <laughs> which is which? Textual criticism is a very good thing, and they have some tenets that go like this. The most odd construction or the shortest construction is probably the original because people don't tend to take away from the Bible, they tend to add to it. Now, where would a scribe, why would a scribe writing this want to add and the Lord Jesus Christ? Why would he want to add that? Because it's in every other one of Paul's readings. Did you remember reading them? 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Thessalonians, it's all there. Paul left it out here. Now, <clears throat> One point I want to make that I think is valid. Even though textual criticism may have some valid tenets by which they decide what the text ought to be, this little phrase in the Lord Jesus Christ is in some excellent old Greek manuscripts. It's in Aleph and it's in A. Now, folks, you don't get any better than those manuscripts. That's why they're called Aleph and A. <laughs> I really think that maybe textual criticism has gone a little too far in saying it's not here. King James lovers, I'm going to go with you this time. Let's put it back in the book. And the Lord Jesus Christ, in my opinion, ought to be in the text. Okay, now, uh, let's go to the number th verse 3. Now, verse 3 is a prayer. Verse 3 through 8 is a prayer. Remember, if I had time to read it, all the introductions of all these different books, you'd find it is characteristic of Greek letters and of Paul that after you say from someone to someone, uh, greetings, then you say a little prayer. Right? We've it in all kinds 
of literature. And Paul, true to his day, writes a prayer in the vast majority of his letters after the introduction. Not everyone, the vast majority of them, and he does it here. Now, he makes it distinctly Christian, but he does it. He's a man of his day, just like you are a man or a woman of your day. Every time we pray, we thank God our Father uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then I'm going to wait for the because. The word every time is the word always. It can go with every time we pray or every time we think. And yet there's no way grammatically to know. I think it's related to both. Paul's saying, we pray all the time, and every time we pray, we think about you. Do you have a prayer list? If you don't have a prayer list, you don't pray long. Do you have people's names down that you're praying for, written in your Bible that you pray for? John Doe, Susie Smith, Ralph so-and-so. Do you have people down, and every time you pray, you go through that list? Can you see the Apostle Paul with a list of all the churches and people that he loved and were praying for? I'm sure he prayed for the heretics, false teachers. Friend, Paul had a list, I think, and when he prayed, and he prayed all the time, he would remember that list. We thank God the Father. Now, man, I want to tell you, that is a characteristic mark of the book of Colossians. Let me give you a few places the word thank and the word thanksgiving and the word prayer and sense of adoration and thanksgiving appears. Chapter 1, verse here, verse 3, verse 12, chapter 2, verse 7, chapter 3, verse 15, verse 17, chapter 4, verse 2. Paul's heart, writing to a church that had tremendous theological problems with the prayer of thanksgiving. That means in any situation in life, we can thank God. Paul was thanking God for these people. Notice it says, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to stop a minute on the word Lord. You say, ah, why? That's so common. The word Lord has tremendous theological significance. When that name was attached to the name of Jesus, it meant something in that early church that is overwhelming to theological implications of this epistle. The word Lord, as you know from your Old Testament, because the Jew was afraid to pronounce the covenant name for God, Yahweh, revealed in Exodus chapter 3. Because he was afraid if he pronounced that word and took it in vain, he'd be guilty of breaking one of the Ten Commandments, and that was bad news. So he thought, if taking God's name in vain is the problem, I just won't mention the name. Now, see, that's legalism, blowing and going. You could, you could curse, use the word Lord in an irrespectful way, but you couldn't use the word Yahweh. You see how it gets into legalism very quickly? So they started pronouncing the word Lord. Every time they'd come to the covenant name for God, they'd pronounce Lord. So Lord came to be the Old Testament title for the covenant name for God. Now, in the Greek day, the Caesar had claimed to be deity, didn't he? And he claimed to say that I'm a god, and you'll call me Lord Caesar, or Caesar is Lord. Now, they didn't have a Pledge of Allegiance, but they had a political slogan. And instead of standing up and crossing your heart and saluting the flag, you had to burn a little incense to the deity of Caesar. And you had to pronounce the political patriotic phrase, Caesar is Lord. And they came to those Christians' homes and said, I want you to burn a little incense to show that you're a, a true patriot. And I want you to say, Caesar is Lord. Those Christians said, no, sir. We have but one Lord. His name is Jesus. And we'll not use that term for anybody else for any reason. And that's what started the Roman persecution. Those Christians could not and would not say, Jesus, I mean, Caesar is Lord. Because when they were baptized, their confession of faith was, Jesus is Lord. What they were saying is, think with me, they were using the title for the covenant God in the Old Testament, and they were applying it to the man, Jesus Christ, and they were saying, Jesus is God in the flesh. Now, when Paul says the Lord Jesus Christ, you can just mark it up, he's emphasizing the deity of Jesus. And in that day, it was greatly significant. Because, and here's the reasons for Paul's prayer of thanksgiving, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all God's people, because of your hope of what is laid up for you in heaven. And now, we have heard, heard from who? 
Heard from Epaphras, chapter 7, I mean verse 7, chapter 1. Epaphras came to prison in Rome to tell Paul about the church. Paul didn't want to say Epaphras came poor mouth in you. <laughs> Epaphras came to tell him what the pitch you were. <laughs> Paul says, Epaphras came to tell me of your great faith and love. The tactful person, Paul. Now, he's going to chew their ears off in a minute, but uh, right now, he's thanking God for their faith and love. <laughs> And so um, he, he also wanted to know that Epaphras told him about the, the love they had down in verse 8. We'll see that now. We have heard of your faith in Christ. There it is. In Christ. Lock it up sphere. Faith is the source and ground of everything that follows. Without faith, there is no other relationship with God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, you can't know God through Christ. Faith is the indispensable element that begins the Christian life. Remember, justification, point action, sanctification, glorification. Let's go back. Faith. And once you meet God by faith, what happens to your life? You begin to love. And love becomes a characteristic of how you live. And then what's the next word? Hope. And what's hope represent? Second coming. Second coming. These little triads, faith, hope, and love, are almost as common as Paul's in Christ. Listen to the number of places it appears. Romans 5, 2 through 5. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Ephesians 4, 2 through 5. 1 Thessalonians 1, 3. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. Man, Paul was always talking about faith, love, and hope. He had mixed the order up sometime, but faith is always first. Now, a man who's rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ by faith is a man who's going to show the characteristics of God's family and the way he loves one another. How do you know love God and is a bigot? God help us. Intellectually, racially, socially, they don't do it like I do it. Well, whoever said they had to? Love is a characteristic of God's people. And it's a characteristic you love all of God's people. You don't pick and choose which ones you like and don't like. You love all of God's people, not because of who you are, because that love don't come from man. That's a God-given love that comes by the Holy Spirit from faith in Christ. Now, Love all of God's people because of your hope of what is left. Now, the hope, hope usually in the New Testament, usually, not every time, but usually means hope in the, what's called the parousia, the second coming, resurrection day, all of that. That's what hope is. It's not an English if, maybe, could be, possibly, I wish. It's a, I'm sure about it, but I don't know when. It's happening. I just don't know when. I'll be there. I don't know how or when. That's what hope is. And when it says this hope is laid up for you in heaven, then I tell you, my mind ran to a passage that I just love. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 1 Peter 1, 4, where it says, Yes, we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, which is guarded in heaven for you, you who are also guarded by the power of God through faith, in order that you might receive that final salvation which will be ready to be uncovered for you at the last time. We have faith in Christ. We are interpenetrated by the love of the Holy Spirit and our whole attitude about people and things change. And one day you can mark it down the calendar you just can't put the day. We're going to see him face to face. Because our inheritance is guarded in heaven by God and our person is guarded on earth by God. Folks, when God promised it, you can mark it up. It'll happen. Now, notice where it uh, says here, long ago you heard of this hope. Now, long ago is not a good translation. It should be previously. It's not talking about way, way back. It's talking about Epaphras' preaching. Previously is a much better translation. Previously, uh, you heard of this hope through the message of the good news which reached you. Now, what Paul is saying, he's putting his official stamp of apostolic authority and approval Blapo, right on Epaphras' is preaching and ministry. Isn't he? Isn't that what he's saying? The good news you've heard about, you've heard about not from Epaphras, he's just saying, Blap, Epaphras is a minister of the true good news. He's a minister of the gospel. And he's going to say that later down here about our fellow servant, Epaphras. But here he's saying, the good, by saying Epaphras, their knowledge of God is right and true, they're saying that Paul approves Epaphras' preaching. Now, um, 
Notice what it says, and since it is bearing fruit and growing among you. Now, it is is a middle tense verb in Greek. How about turning to the, your sheet on Greek grammatical terms? What does middle tense mean? I'm sure you have it there somewhere. <laughs> Greek voice. Middle means the subject of the sentence is producing the action. The gospel itself, we have personified the good news into a person, and it is an energetic person who is doing something. What are they doing? It's bearing fruit and growing. You want to know a sure, a sure mark of the true gospel? It always has fruit. Always has fruit. Because God's word doesn't go out void, but it doesn't accomplish that which God purposed. A mark of the true gospel is people coming to know Christ by faith and Christians being matured in their faith. It's doing two things. It's bearing fruit and growing, both present tense verbs. It's continuing to bear fruit. It's continuing to grow. When I heard that thing, bear fruit, my mind ran back to the parable of the soil. Out of four different kinds of soils where the seed fell, only one kind ever came to fruition. The others were choked out by the weed, destroyed by the thin soil, or picked up by the birds. Germination is not the sign of the Christian life. Fruition is the sign of the Christian life. Keeping on, keeping on for Jesus and bearing fruit for him is the sign, not the initial response. Oh, listen to me. Now, uh, just as it is, it, it, it just as it is all over the world. Now, is that... I believe the Bible is literally true. Paul being literal here. You think anybody in China has heard the good news yet? Anybody in America heard the good news yet? We'll forget the Mormon submarine for a moment. Anybody in Canada heard the good news yet? Has anybody but the Roman world heard the good news yet? Huh? No. When he says all the world, is Paul being a little preachery exaggeration? What else 10,000 that meeting? You should have seen them. It was 35, you know? Paul is using an example that all people use. He's saying the whole world's heard of it. He's saying meaning the whole Roman world. And that's not, well, you don't believe the Bible literally true. No, I believe in human language that communicates truth. And human language is not always does not always mean exactly what you say. There are cultural idioms. You've got to hate father and mother. It's a cultural idiom. If you take that literally, you destroy the meaning of what Jesus said. Same is true here. Does it mean the whole world? All oh, the Bible's wrong then. No. It is the use of language to convey thought. Paul's saying, everybody has heard about you. Now, does that mean the Indian and the Chinese and the Russians and all? No. It's just a way of expressing the whole Roman world. And from the day you first heard of God's favor, heard of God's grace, his attack at the heretics, Paul preached the grace of God plus nothing in Jesus Christ. The heretics preached grace is good and fine, but you've got to really know the angels to get through to heaven. You've got to really hurt your body for God to love you. You've got to really know this magical system of eons and stair-step powers and Boy, you've really got to... Paul says, look, I preach to you the grace of God. Plus nothing. First heard of God's favor or grace. And in reality, you came to know it. This is the word gnosko, same word for Gnostic, but with a little preposition, epi, epigenosko, it means full and experiential knowledge. The heretics again. Come join our club. We've got secret knowledge. We've got deeper knowledge. We'll give you in-depth Bible study. You're doing Bible study, you're doing Bible study. In-depth just means... I don't know what it means. It's kind of like knowing the real Greek. I mean, if you got Greek, you got Greek, right? I mean, uh, what's the real Greek mean? Uh, here we have knowledge. Paul says, you know fully and experientially what I'm saying. Don't listen to those guys that can't about knowledge. Knowledge has never been the key to the Christian faith. Jesus is the key to Christian faith. Yes, and you know it, verse 7, as you learned it from Epaphras, 
Epaphras is mentioned in Colossians 4, 12 and 13, and Philemon 23, um, a very trusted companion of Paul in Asia Minor especially. Our dearly beloved fellow slave, as a faithful minister of Christ, now, does yours have for me or for you? Me or you? 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 How many have you? King James? Aleph, A, B, and D all have the word our. Our parallels the phrase, our dearly beloved fellow slave. Our is apparently the reading that Paul wrote. Your, uh, though it may be true that he's, an, he's a representative of them, is not probably, I'll make a son, is not the correct text. Our our servant. What Paul's saying is, he is my official representative. You say, well, how did Paul know him? Paul preached in Ephesus two years in Acts 19.10, and the whole, it said, a door to the whole area is open for me. Epaphras was converted to Paul, and Paul sent him out to start a church in Colossae, in the Lycus Valley. Should be minister of Christ for me, or our minister, something like that. Verse 8. He is the very one who told me of your love. Notice, Epaphras didn't come and tell me how bad you were. He came and told me how, of your love. Now, he told me how bad things were, but he, did, he first of all told me of your love. Um, of your love awakened in you by... Now, does you have a little spirit or a capital spirit? Everybody have capital? Anybody have a little spirit? As you know, it's interpretive. Many folks think that this, that this is speaking about the love generated in your spirit by God. This is the only reference in the whole book of Colossians to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Surprise you? Kind of did me. I think, obviously, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. I don't even get around it. I think there's some parallels where it's talking about the human spirit, but uh, this, this construction here, in my opinion, about love being awakened into us. Who awakens love in us? The Holy Spirit. And so, therefore, I think it ought to be capital... And I agree completely with that. Okay, questions or comments? Yes, Matt? Yes. Some think there is. I don't. It's kind of like I was writing there the other day, and I had the word, I used the word personally three times. It was Phil. It was the introduction to the International Sense Lesson he was taping for me. It sounded funny to have the same word three times in two sentences. It, it didn't sound good to me. So I changed one of them. Well, I think what Paul is doing is just uh, an unconscious flipping and flopping. Now, some think that when he says Christ, Jesus, he's emphasizing uh, the Messiahship of Christ. And when he says Jesus Christ, he's emphasizing the humanity of Christ. I think that's reading way too much in that little variation. Yeah, because he flips it and flops it all the time without any apparent meaning to, in the context to me. Yes, Winston. Yeah. Yeah, I think the real question comes in, what is fruit, I guess? Um, I think it's obvious that Galatians 5, 22, 23 are here, that the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, and the rest of those characteristics are go with love. I think that's obvious that all Christians ought to have that. I think where we get uh, probably uh, uptight is where we think that fruit is synonymous with soul winning. Um, I think every Christian ought to witness. I don't think there's any doubt in the Bible that every Christian ought to share their faith. But I know that some have a gift of evangelism and are going to win more people than I do. I don't have that gift. So I don't feel guilty about not winning as many people as Church X over here. But I do think that part of the fruit of love is a concern for lost men and a continual sharing in a lifestyle way of our faith verbally. Not just living a good life, but sharing verbally. And so I guess the fight would be, what, 
what is fruit exactly? Uh, I'm not sure I can answer that. Maybe it's spiritual growth, you think, uh, becoming more and more uh, pliable in God's hands to his leadership, or an inner Christ life. I just don't know what... What do y'all think the fruit means? What do you think fruit in the Christian life is? Anybody? It's kind of a hard question, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, that'd be my only quick answer to that. Yeah, it sure is. In that Galatians 5, 2, you know that it says the fruit of the Spirit is, well, the fruit is is singular. So the fruit is love, and then goodness, kindness, patience, self-control are really aspects of love, I think. Yes, Roy? Oh, knowing him, he probably did. Yeah. Right. Somebody, somebody planned a seed, didn't they? Somebody watered and somebody reaped. Uh, I think when we do, yeah, I, I keep hearing those things all the time from not only the particular one you're talking about, many others. I think we ought not to say that we win somebody to Christ. I think we ought to say that Christ has won somebody through us. Maybe be a better way of putting it. Yeah, I agree with that. Sure do. That's like someone who comes and accepts Christ down here. Um, I've heard people say, boy, in my preaching, somebody, I won someone to Christ. I doubt that. Very few people are won by being preached out of the audience. But people are won by being loved by their friends and neighbors, you know? And so uh, accepting Christ is the fruition of a lot of years of people's love and patience and kindness. But again, I also know that people, that, you know, I, Wayne Bristow, uh, I sat here and listened to his sermon for a week. I wasn't tremendously impressed. Uh, you know, I don't think he's the greatest preacher ever lived. But I was overwhelmed at what the Holy Spirit did the response. Weren't you? I mean, it's like Billy Graham. You know, he ain't no moody. Wonderful person, but he's not the greatest preacher ever lived. But he is an evangelist. And that guy can preach a sermon on uh, the Outer Mongolian dirt trap. And 5,000 people accept Christ, you know. I, it just amazes me how the Holy Spirit uses those guys. But they just have that gift of, of just drawing people to the gospel. I, it amazes me. So I know, and I think he has that. I, I don't take that away at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, me. Yeah, Lee. Right. Our attitudes expressed in our daily life. You know, that's a great point, because if we were going to judge by their fruits, you shall know them. If fruit is converts, the false teachers got us to beat 100%. I'm going to tell you, Jim Jones had the fruit if it's converts, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. So it can't be that. It's got to be that inner attitude, doesn't it? Because those guys in Matthew 7 were doing all the outward fruit, preaching, healing, teaching, but there wasn't anything in her. So I, that's very good. I think that's... I appreciate that. That's motives that work themselves out in life. Christ likeness it might, might be a good way of talking about fruit bearing in the Christian life. Don't be shy. We don't fail nobody on theological reasons. Okay.
เนี่ย That's very scary parable, isn't it? Because boy, all four of them had a chance at the word of God. Now, of course, the birds are, are interpreted as being Satan. Okay, he just took it away out of the heart before the person responded to it. But the last three are very difficult because all three responded to the message, right? And they, it, it's uh, spoken of as sprouting up like a good plant. But one of them, the worldliness got him. That's the thorns, and the worldliness crushed out. The plant, the plant died. The second one was in shallow soil. Sal- <laughs> That's where it was, and uh, <laughs> it looked good. It was a good plant, but as the plant grew a little bit and the sun beat down, implication, persecution, the trials of this world, problems, the plant died. And only the plant in the good soil that grew and continued to grow and bear and bore fruit. Was the one that is said to be Christians. So <clears throat> that's a very difficult one to deal with. But apparently, that is what that parable means. That fruition, not germination, is the sign of Christianity. I would put it in other theological terms: once saved, always saved. Yes, but the flip side of that, which has to be there, is that the true saints will persevere, or they will hold out to the end, or they will come to fruition. God will see to it. So. I want to add, except Christ, yes, but if it's true and valid, there will be a staying power. There'll be some ups and downs. I don't know that about that. There'll be a staying power till the end. Does that make sense at all? See, so long in Baptist life, we preach, except Christ, be baptized, and it's all over. No, friend, it's just begun. <laughs> that's not the end. That's the beginning. Now, I'm not taking away from the beginning. We've got to walk through the door. It's got to be a beginning, but it's only the beginning. The rest is just as important, and that's to keep it on, keep it on, sanctification, perseverance, and that's what those two soils didn't. The world got one.